Now the Bell experiment is another experiment is another result that hints at the um, conclusion or that suggests the conclusion that it's to say the very least very problematic to assign to quantum mechanical observables um, well-defined values independent of of the measurement so pre-existing values independently of our measurement in a bell experiment you have two protagonists two experimenters let them call them again Alice and Bob and they both perform experiments on qubits Alice performs one of two measurements what you see here is a two-dimensional section of the Bloch sphere and when we discussed uh, the Bloch sphere and qubit observables we said that a qubit observable can be visualized as an axis through the Bloch sphere so here the two observables in question that Alice can perform are represented graphically by these two axes uh, the observables are called Q and R and they correspond to the Pauli X and Pauli Z observables uh, the X and the, and the Z axis of the Bloch sphere with possible measurement outcomes plus or minus one for each Bob on the other side also performs one of two measurements on qubits but these measurements are or these axes these measurement axes are rotated against Alice's measurements Bob measures either S or T uh, so these are the two diagonals in the Bloch sphere also with measurement values plus or minus one Alice and Bob are so far apart that they are causally disconnected. This means that whatever Alice does on her side doesn't impact, doesn't influence in any way what Bob does on his side and vice versa. Now, we all know since Einstein's theory of relativity that signals or any kind of information can travel at most with the speed of light. So if you separate Alice and Bob far enough, then with the light signal you would need some minimum time to transfer any kind of information from one side to the other to affect any kind of disturbance on the other side. And you can make that time long enough so that for the duration of their measurement you have no mutual disturbance. Now one considers a particular two qubit observable that is sort of composed of the various single qubit observables that Alice and Bob measure. It's the observable A which is Q times S so the first factor always refers to Alice's measurement the second factor to Bob's measurement so it's Q tensor S plus R tensor S plus R tensor T minus Q tensor T um, this particular combination this particular two qubit observable can also be written in a slightly different form because you have joint factors in some of these terms so you can uh, take out S and T and write it as Q plus R tensor S plus R minus Q tensor T now you cannot measure the the four different terms in the sum 
you cannot measure them jointly because um, they don't commute but you can still determine the expectation value of a simply by running in, a, in some given two qubit state simply by preparing this qubit state many times and running the measurements many times and then for some set of measurements you measure the first product q times s and then for some runs in some runs you measure r times s and so on so you measure separately the expectation values of the four terms in the sum and then you add them up and you get the expectation value for a yeah so it is possible simply by preparing the same state many times and performing many measurements to determine the expectation value of this observable a and on a theoretical level you can derive constraints on that expectation value. If you make assumptions similar to the assumptions uh, that we made in the case of the Paris Merman square, namely what is called realism and locality. Realism is this assumption that on a fundamental level, each observable actually has a well-defined value. So we can assign to each observable a well-defined pre-existing value, which is then uncovered by measurement. And locality is similar to non-contextuality. Um, here in this context, it means that the value assigned to an observable measured by Alice doesn't depend on which measurement is performed by Bob at the other end. And that sounds eminently plausible because they are causally disconnected. So how could a measurement performed by Bob possibly influence the value of an observable on Alice's side. Yeah, so this is this assumption is called locality. And let's see what consequence this, these assumptions have for the expectation value of A. Look at the two observables that are measured by Alice, Q and R. Each observable can have the values plus or minus one. Now there are two cases, either the two observables have the same values, so on this fundamental level where each observable has a well-defined value, either the values of Q and R are identical. In this case, Q plus R is either plus two or minus two, and R minus Q is zero. Or the two values are different, so one is plus one, the other one is minus one. In this case, Q plus R vanishes, and R minus Q is either plus two or minus two. So whatever case you have, if you look at the expression for this observable A on the right hand side with the brackets, one of the two brackets always vanishes and the other one is plus two or minus two. And then this is multiplied by S or T, which is also either plus one or minus one. So you have for the observable A, you have plus or minus two times plus or minus one, yeah, whichever scenario you have. So the possible values of A are plus two or minus two. When you 
measure or calculate the expectation value, then it will be some probability weighted average of plus two and minus two. So the expectation value will be somewhere between plus two and minus two. And this means the absolute value of the expectation value in any case is at most two. And this, and this inequality, this upper bound for the absolute value of the expectation value of A is called the CHSH inequality. It's a particular variant of Bell's inequality. It's named after the four authors uh, I think it's Klauser, Horn, Shimoni, Holt, the four authors. And um, it's an upper bound for the absolute value of the expectation value of A. Now let's look at what the experiments ta actually show, what the experiments reveal. If you prepare two qubits in a Bell state, in a particular Bell state, namely the Bell state beta 1 1, it's the form you see the formula on the uh, bottom right. Yeah, that's the entangled Bell state beta 1 1. And you calculate the expectation value of this observable A in this particular Bell state then you find that the expectation value of a is actually two times square root of two. And that's not only a theoretical result, but you can, in an experiment, you can prepare this belt state and you can measure the expectation value and you find also experimentally two times square root of two. So it violates the CHSH inequality. This means, and this is obviously a contradiction, and this means that at least one of the two assumptions that led to the CHSH inequality must have been wrong. So either you have non-locality, which would mean that actually what Alice measures on her side does depend on whatever Bob does on the other side, even if, according to the theory of relativity, the two labs are causally disconnected, which would be a very disturbing conclusion. Or, once again, you have to conclude that it is actually impossible to assign to each observable a well-defined definite value um, that is then uncovered by measurement. It's a little bit a matter of taste, which um, for you is the lesser evil. Um, the traditional Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory developed by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg is to abandon the notion of realism, to say that not only that quantum theory not only tells you that there are limitations on what you can learn about these values, but the observables actually do not have these values. It is even on a, on a fundamental level which for us is inaccessible experimentally but which you could um, imagine hypoth hypothetically, theoretically, it's impossible to assign well-defined values to all the observables. So this is, um, these are very deep uh, conceptual results about quantum theory and um, but they are not only of conceptual interest but as we shall see on the on the next slide they 
also have um, important practical use because what I showed you here will be the basis for the EPR protocol for quantum cryptography. I would like to add one final remark about this um, expectation value of A in this particular Bell state because that will be necessary to understand the EPR protocol for cryptography. This value 2 times the square root of 2 that is called the Cyrilson bound and it's actually within quantum theory the largest possible value that the expectation value of A can attain. So it's the um, th there's no other state in which the expectation value of A is greater than the Cyrilson bound, greater than 2 times the square root of 2. Actually you can show that this observable A um, has 2 times square root of 2 as its largest eigenvalue. Uh, a is an, is an observable and has a real, a real spectrum and the largest eigenvalue is the Cyrilson bound, is 2 times the square root of 2. This eigenvalue is non-degenerate. So there's a unique eigenstate and this is this Bell state beta 1 1 that you see here. This has the consequence, and we will exploit that when we look at the EPR protocol, that whenever you have a state in which the expectation value of A is equal to 2 times the square root of 2, then you can be sure it must be this Bell state, because it's the only one with this expectation value.